time for vigilance, sickle cell, and racial justice in a pandemic. Our lives abruptly changed for what felt like the worst and last days of our lives, as all routines across the globe were shaken to the core. For those who are immune compromised, COVID-19 becomes a serious and heightened risk, especially so for those with sickle cell. Sickle cell trait is an inherited blood disorder that affects 1 million to 3 million Americans and 8 to 10% of African Americans. First, I think it's important to break infection down into several pieces. First, to be infected, you have to be exposed. Then the virus needs to take hold within your body. And we have multiple barriers to protect us. Physical barriers, like a wall, like the linings of our nose and our lungs, and then immune barriers, our immune system that recognizes something foreign and attacks us. So that all is important for the virus actually getting into us. Then once it's in us, the virus can do damage. And then finally, when the virus is in us, our immune systems hopefully rev up and start attacking the virus. So when the red blood cells get stressed and they change shape and become sticky, they can set off a whole bunch of different things. It can cause damage to a lot of different parts of your body. In terms of immunocompromise, a couple things happen. One is it breaks down, weakens, kills off parts of your spleen. First, it filters out certain types of infection from your blood. So it's just a giant filter. That's another way immune systems work. But it also supports cells that make antibodies and help those immune responses I was talking to. So in sickle cell, when your spleen is damaged, it's not a major across the board immunocompromise, but your ability to fight some types of infections don't go away, but they're less. For today's sickle cell patients, drug treatments, allogenic transplants, and a targeted diet are approaches that have proven better outcomes than the limited answers of the past. The bottom line is, both young and old with the disease, vigilance is key to preventing COVID-19. In my era, it was a lonely kind of place because you didn't know anybody else. I found out when I was about 19 me and another guy saw each other that went to school at the emergency and he said, you didn't even say hi, he just said, do you have sickle cell? I said, yes, you? He said, yes. Never got each other's name or number or anything. It's a battle, it's a learning process. You gotta teach people who you are and that you're an individual from other sickle cell patients. Back then, they didn't have a whole lot they could do for you. They gave us penicillin, told us to take Tylenol, and my mom did a lot of massaging and putting alcohol on me and Bengay and heating pads. My blood level had dropped down to like 14 and it runs around 22. Before I went in, they said, you need to be tested for COVID. And it came back positive, didn't have any signs. I was blessed that right after it started and when I got it, my son had to come stay with me and take care of me and be in quarantine with me. I pray. That's my biggest thing, to pray and ask to be cleared and safe. Um, you can't let yourself be afraid of everything. I mean, as our people, there's always something going on and something that can scare you, just like things are now but uh, you just gotta give it to God and, and do your best at handling your life. I want her to experience a normal life and being able to run and jump and play ball, uh, sports. Uh, you know, there's, there was one young lady that became a doctor and trying to do that and have sickle cell is not an easy thing and go to school and not have to take medicine. And, um, but to be able to know that she can be cured without going through a lot of another illness or another medication that's supposed to help it along. None of these kids experience having to walk on a walker, use a walker to walk. Got one hip 
higher than the other one. You've got messed up knees, hips and shoulders, you know. I, I just really pray that you guys don't have to go through all that. You know, that they can get that cure out there if you want to take it. And it'll be safe and quick and like the girl on TV, if you want to do karate, you can be thrown to the mat and be all right. So that's what I want to stop. We got enough killing us out there than having the disease is killing us too. Simultaneously to the pandemic, people are taken to the streets to protest police brutality against black men and women. This movement has a focused and unwavering demand for systemic change on every level. The courts can be a foundational place to begin righting the wrongs of the past that have devastated Blacks in America. Our court issued a letter on June 4th um, addressed to judges and lawyers around the state. And the purpose of the letter was to draw attention uh, to the issues that Black Lives Matter raised. Uh, for us at the time, there were several Supreme Courts around the nation beginning to speak. And it was evident to us that maybe we were part of the problem. And as far as we're concerned, there's no neutrality when it comes to racism. Good people have to speak out and raise the question. And certainly as a court system, uh, we feel an obligation to speak out against something that we abhor, and that is racism. We cannot turn away from the racialization of policing. Uh, we cannot turn away from the reality that there is a disproportionate number of Black Americans in our jails, in our prisons, and frankly, the subject of investigation and stopping. We can't ignore that reality. If there's any place that's a petri dish for the spread of COVID, it's going to be prisons and jails where it's not possible to socially distance. And so we wanted our judges to really pause and stop and ask, is it really necessary to incarcerate somebody? Is it really necessary to issue a bench warrant for somebody not appearing, especially if they were not a risk to the public? Uh, and so we invited all of our judges and directed our judges to not issue bench warrants for matters that did not really concern public safety. This was not an easy decision for our court, uh, but once the governor uh, issued a state-wide uh, emergency and public health crisis, we felt we had a responsibility to authorize our local courts to close down. Uh, the fact is most of our court facilities are not designed to socially distance. We knew that our staff did not have the personal protective equipment that would allow people to gather in a courtroom or to come in for jury service. So we had to shut everything down. You know, the diverse makeup of a jury pool is something we're very worried about. We were worried about it pre-COVID, and we're certainly worried about it at this time, especially because we recognize um, how COVID spreads in our communities more readily and easily. And it's not just a matter of recovery, right? We know that people in our communities actually die from COVID. Um, so we're taking it seriously. Uh, there is no judge that I know in the state of Washington who would force someone to sit on a jury trial if they were especially vulnerable to contracting COVID-19. It's probably going to get worse before it gets better. But the one thing that we have to recognize is that culturally, the United States has always wrestled with the tension between the common good and individual liberty. When you go back and even look at the 1918 pandemic, it was the same exact issues. People not wanting to wear masks, people afraid of public health officials compromising their individual liberty. And while we all treasure individual liberty, I wish culturally that we were in a different place, right? That the common good uh, would really govern uh, and that people would make that personal sacrifice. School and college closures due to COVID-19 have created steep educational and career hurdles for students. Focused measures are needed to lift students falling through the cracks. COVID-19 has dramatically affected education with uh, 
uh, colleges and universities pretty much shut down. Uh, a lot of our K through 12 system, the students are not in school, but at home. And that's having an impact, not just on the quality of the education, uh, but also on the impact of parents, many of whom are still trying to work or have to work, posing a big struggle and a burden on working families. It certainly has set back education for so many uh, groups of individuals, uh, certainly people of color. Many of our students of color have had to drop out. Our students at many of our community uh, technical colleges uh, are traditionally older. Uh, they're working part-time. Uh, while uh, paying for their education and or they have families and trying to take care of their families and certainly COVID-19 has disrupted that and so if they're if they're out of work or have been laid off they're not able to continue with their education or pay for their tuition so this is really going to set us back for quite some time and we really need to make sure that our colleges and universities are stepping up really understanding the impact of COVID-19 on the emotional as well as academic the psyche of our students and uh, make sure that we're really trying to provide high quality education uh, at a time when people need this education more than ever. We need to make sure that we're providing some sort of technical assistance, financial assistance to uh, subscribe to or, or sign up for high-speed internet or creating hotspots uh, throughout our communities uh, so that students can use laptops uh, and things like that uh, to uh, receive their education. And obviously, we're seeing uprisings and demonstrations and peaceful protests by and large throughout the country and around the world uh, in solidarity uh, with what uh, uh, Black Americans have been facing for decades, if not centuries. Uh, it's gratifying to see that people all around the world are uh, expressing their support. The police have had to reckon for targeted violence against Blacks. Attention to reform and policing, its funding and training are being insisted on. Police departments in most cities are considering radical reform to prevent racial biases in policing. Well, there's a lot of different ideas about what defunding means. Initially here in Seattle, it was uh, defund the department by 50% which I uh, thought was reckless and not well thought out uh, without having a plan. Uh, and that has been the main thing that has been a concern to me is, you know, what is the plan? We do get 800,000 calls for service a year. So if in fact we have less officers to respond to those calls for service and there's another entity or organization that's better equipped or more equipped and more acceptable to handle those calls, I'm certainly not opposed to that, uh, but we need to see we need to have that group in place uh, because the calls aren't going to stop coming simply because the budget doesn't meet uh, the requirement for the officers. We also still have problems when it comes to unarmed men, specifically black men, you know, dying at the hands of injustice, whether it be by police or neighbors. And we, I think we need to all acknowledge that. So to me, reform would be a situation where we acknowledge you know, some of the real concerns and issues that we have, start figuring out how we're going to minimize, not even minimize, how we're going to abrogate those situations and not have them occur at all and mitigate any of these instances. And it has to have you know, a dialogue and open engagement and involvement with community ongoing. So I think if we do that, that is the best way to get the reform. It needs to be community led by folks who are thinking about it and concerned about it on a daily basis. You know, many people who are out there are concerned about, you know, they'll say police brutality and that is one aspect, but it's just the systemic racism that is across a lot of different genres, whether it's criminal justice, healthcare, or education. Uh, certainly it's most recognized because police, you know, have the ability uh, through their authority to um, take a life, you know, and so for that reason there's an extra level of scrutiny and there should be uh, on police behavior. So I think that, you know, it's not just a moment, it's a movement is what I've been told and I absolutely believe that the time is right uh, to engage in that movement and have the discussion the and the dialogue to move it forward. A pandemic that has taken hundreds of thousands of lives in the U.S. alone. It is a strenuous demand upon Blacks with sickle cell disease to remain alert to the daily risk of infection of COVID-19. What are they talking about the demand? Demands for justice for our black and brown communities has required unwavering vigilance. The pressure of civil race wars are on the top of people's consciousness. It has been a year of cross-section where exhaustion is normative. But hope remains. Another year, one with perhaps more promise is on its way.
being able to run and jump. I want her to experience a normal life.